I call today's subcommittee on health and technology hearing to order. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. As October is National Women's Small Business Month, today our subcommittee will highlight the outstanding impact women entrepreneurs have made on the United States economy and the remarkable growth women-owned small businesses have generated over the last decade. It is estimated that in 2016, there were 11.3 million women-owned businesses that employed nearly 9 million people and generated over $1.6 trillion. Between 2007 and 2016, women-owned businesses increased by approximately 45%. This means that women-owned businesses grew roughly five times faster than the national average. Despite this remarkable increase, we continue to see a significant difference in the number of women and men-owned businesses in the United States. Currently, women-owned businesses only represent roughly 30% of all businesses. Today, we ask, what factors are contributing to this gap? While women entrepreneurs face many challenges, one major issue women owners face is access to adequate financing opportunities. Men typically, typically launch their businesses with twice the capital women do, and less than 10% of all venture funds are granted to women-led businesses. The matter of access to capital is of particular concern to me, as it is a persistent issue among my constituents in American Samoa. Numerous organizations, nonprofits, and companies are working to address the capital challenge women entrepreneurs face through advocacy, education, and outreach. The Small Business Administration's Women Business Centers and the SCORE are excellent examples of these types of programs. Despite the wonderful work of these organizations, women entrepreneurs still face significant challenges when starting, growing, and scaling their businesses. Today, we will hear from an outstanding panel of witnesses who will shed light on the challenges women entrepreneurs face, the resources currently available, and the areas where existing resources could be expanded to benefit women's businesses. The personal experiences of many of our panelists are stories of remarkable perseverance and strength that have resulted in success. I look forward to learning from each of you. I now recognize myself for five minutes of questions. My first question is for our three small business owner panelists. Each of your testimonies references the challenges you faced when starting and growing your businesses. Of those, what was the greatest challenge you experienced or continue to experience as a woman entrepreneur? Ms. King? The greatest challenge I experienced was access to capital. I had to self-finance my business, and again, I started with $10,000 and, and credit cards and um, you know, a, a second mortgage on my parents' property. Um, that is not so much of a problem anymore because I do poor, poor people financing. That's what I call that. I will find a way to make it work, and I have, again, by some small miracle, but I think that is a challenge for every business that starts, starts out without capital. Ms. Green? My greatest challenge would be mentorship. When I started my business, I had that issue, and Betsy came along. And even though today, I still have that issue because as you go to another level, you need higher mentorship. So that's my greatest challenge right now, to have someone to lead me to the next level. Ms. Clark? I think my greatest challenge now is uh, support at the second stage of a business. Um, as I mentioned, I used a lot of the resources early on and as a founder of the business, there are, are a lot of resources there. But as the company has grown, I would love to see the women business centers funded so that they can provide more enhanced programs for more mature companies in the second stage of business. My next question is for Ms. Pinalto. Unfortunately, the WBC previously located in American Samoa closed, limiting the access my constituents have to WBC resources. What is the AWBC doing to work with individual WBCs? 
to increase their ability to remain open long term? So thank you for that question. Um, what we have been working on for the last couple of years, I've, I've been at the helm of the AWBC for three years now, is m more uh, sharing of best practices, sharing of the experiences of some of the larger WBCs and the more experienced WBC directors. There was not a lot of that done uh, prior, so uh, we're actually working on a, a very big project right now where we will develop best practices, we will develop SOPs, templates that all WBCs can um, can use. Some of our smaller ones, and America Samoa was one of those, uh, are, are, it's challenging for them. Uh, as part of their grant obligation, they have to match the grant money that is provided by SBA. In the first couple of years, it's a 50% match, and then after that, it's a 100% match. For the centers that are in communities that don't have large corporations or other sources of funding, it's a challenge. And I don't know all the specifics of, of what happened with the WBC in America Samoa because SBA doesn't share that. But I know raising funds is, is one of those. And, and so we are trying to provide training and um, and support to those centers and helping them raise that funding, but it's a big issue. Thank you, Ms. Pinalto. As a follow-up, what is the AWBC doing to expand the resources available to WBCs through WBCs to clients without access to brick-and-mortar training centers? So, I think the value of the Women's Business Centers is, the, um, is their work within their communities. So it is a challenge for them to provide the services outside of that community um, that, they, that perhaps might not have the physical access. I mean, we do hear that frequently that, and, and some of our panelists today talk about that, it's that interaction um, with the centers and not only with the staff of the centers, but the interaction with other um, women business owners. They create this community and build, the, build this network. So it is challenging for those communities that don't have a center right there. We do have centers, um, I'll use an example of our one in North Dakota. It's one center and, and it covers the entire state and they are on the road constantly going into the communities um, and bringing the resources there. Not all of the centers have that capability. Many of our centers have one to one and a half staff people. It's very difficult for them to cover a large geographical territory with that kind of uh, staffing. Thank you. I have a question for Ms. King. Your testimony discusses your journey to entrepreneurship. What made you decide to pursue creating SRE despite the immense challenges you faced? Thank you. As a single mother, it was very important for me um, to provide my son the opportunity to go to college and not struggle the way I did growing up. And so that was really my inspiration. And quite honestly, failure was not an option. Uh, my son just left for college in August, and I was able to pay for his entire six years of college, and he's going to be a doctor. Ms. Green? Uh Access to adequate financing has been a key topic in today's hearing. You mentioned that your business is self-funded. Had you had access to alternative funding, how do you anticipate your business experience would have changed? If I had access to uh, alternative funding, my business would have grown much more. I would have marketing, uh, someone to market my business. I would have all the right tools that a business run. And when I started my business, um, the $25,000 didn't go too far. So I actually had extra help, but not from the banks or any other funding. I grew from being part of White Sea 2015 to 2016, I grew to $2 million. I figured if I had access, I would have been a $10 million by now. So I think if we have, because the plan that I have can allow me, but don't have the funding is a problem for us. This question is for Ms. Penalto. Your testimony cites a study which says that if women started businesses with the same capital as men, they could create six million jobs in five years. What do you see as the reason or reasons that women are not currently able to gain access to that same level of funding that men do? 
I wish I knew the, exa all of the exact answer, um, but I'll cite a, a few things that I, I think contribute to it. Um, I think one of the issues is, I think it's over 40% of women-owned businesses are in professional and, um, and personal service businesses. And I hear stories all the time of women, it's like the women at this table, it's much harder to get funding, traditional funding, especially through banks, if you're a ser in the service industry because you don't have the collateral, you don't have the assets that a, uh, another type of business might have. So I think because more women are in that type of business, that's, uh, that's one of the, the issues. Uh, I think another issue is just the number of women actually asking for uh, capital. Uh, we need to educate and train and help them through the process of applying for either a loan, a, 7, a 7A loan, SBA loan, or a traditional loan. Um, some of those studies that I cited in terms of even the venture capital um, statistics, again, it's the number of women that are going and asking for that venture to capital. We need to increase those numbers. So I think th that will help. I, I will also say that we don't have great statistics, especially from bank lending, on lending to women and minorities because banks aren't required to keep those statistics and share them. So we don't really know in some instances if a woman has gone to a bank what the reason was that she didn't uh, get, didn't get that loan. So um, I know the CFPB is supposed to be uh, writing rules that were included, a uh, provision included in the Dodd-Frank Act for banks to collect that data, and I, uh, it's been how many years now, and that hasn't happened. Until we have better data about what women are going through in that, I'm not sure we're going to know all of the answers. Ms. Clark? Your testimony mentions that you started your business out of necessity as a means of providing a better work-life balance for you and your family. In what ways do you believe that being an entrepreneur of necessity affected your business creation process? That's a very good question. Being an entrepreneur of necessity, um, oftentimes you start with a little bit of knowledge because uh, you know, you're really fueled to do something different and to have what you need, which in my case is work-life balance. A 12 and a nine-year-old are, are busy ages to raise children and I needed to be there and did not have the leave and the flexibility. Um, so that sort of pushed me out there. Had I um, been fueled by another aspect, I probably would have had more preparation, certainly would have had better technology, um, and would have received um, probably funding earlier because I would have asked for it. Just as you mentioned, I didn't know to ask for it. Uh, so preparing to be an entrepreneur and being an entrepreneur of necessity are very different um, starting points. And I would encourage that even women who are not sure or to be, for women to begin to learn more about perhaps in um, middle or even high and, and high school and college to just learn that entrepreneurship is um, a, a way that they can increase their family's income. So for me, I think uh, had I been um, not an uh, entrepreneur of necessity, I would have been more prepared to start my company. Thank you. I'd like to thank each of the witnesses for being here today, and I'd like to congratulate Ms. King, Ms. Green, Ms. Clark, for the outstanding success of each of your businesses. And thank you, Ms. Pinalto, for the important work the AWBC is doing to provide our nation's women entrepreneurs with the resources they need to be successful. It's clear that uh, while impressive growth has been seen in the number of women-owned small businesses over the last decade, there's still a great deal of work to be done. So as we continue to work to address the challenges facing women entrepreneurs, such as access to adequate financing, this committee applauds the success and dedication of both our nation's women business owners and those organizations seeking to help them succeed. Now I ask unanimous consent that members have five legislative days to submit statements and supporting materials for the record. Without objection, so ordered. We are adjourned. Fa'tai te le lava, soi fuwa. <laughs>